My name is Jonas, and my name is Leif. Okay, good answer. Yes, it was a so, trick question. <laughs> yeah. So what we're going to be doing tonight is basically taking a quick look to web components and what it actually does to, to web framework market. I mean, we as a web framework vendor, we are kind of looking web components in, in one direction and kind of trying to analyze what what is it changing on the market and how should we react? But still, who we are. So this guy over here, he is uh, managing Warden Framework. Uh, it's a bit strange fellow. I mean, when we hired him, it was like four years ago? Three and a half. Three and a half. Anyways, it was like on the first week he came to a full company meeting and said, hey, I had a dream last night. And that dream was about how Warden LPC mechanism working, how the communication is working. And then I couldn't sleep and I kind of hacked together a prototype. And actually that prototype happens to end up to Vardin 7, so he kind of invented that on his fourth day on, on the job. And this guy over here, he is like uh, the one guy who has started most of the Vardin stuff. So if you find some old APIs and they are really strange, you probably know whom to blame. At least he is blaming me all the time. Yes, it's really fun. <laughs> uh, Git blame is my favorite tool. Uh, another thing, uh, these estimations are always also interesting because everything is always straightforward and nobody really believes it, but sometimes it turns out okay. Yeah, we just had a really nice argument about estimations. I was kind of betting that I can code this in one week. And yeah, and my bet was two and a half, and that's also optimistic. Yeah. So uh, first off, I, I think we should kind of start looking at the web framework trends, what's happening with web frameworks. And one of the trends lately that have been changing the market the most, I, I think, is the model view whatever, model view M, uh, MVC on the client side. And we have a disruptive projector as well, it seems. So this guy over there on the market, it has changed things quite a bit. I'm, I mean, who's using AngularJS? Who likes AngularJS? The same guys. Oh, actually, even <laughs> more guys. <laughs> <laughs> this picture is not that pretty. I mean, this red line over here, it's AngularJS, how they actually have started to gain traction around 2012, 2013. And in a couple of years, they have basically uh, surpassed GWT, and uh, now they are around 4x the popularity of GWT if you are just measuring the uh, Google Trends. Uh, and it's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, especially around that A there. Wonder what happened there. Suddenly it started dropping for Angular. Yeah, it no was Misco actually, in the European conference, they announced 2.0. And ah, yeah. okay. So, why is that? Why are these guys popular? These guys popular? What do you think? Who remembers this guy? What is this? Exactly. That's awesome. And the thing was that before this guy, there weren't anything like this on the market. So it kind of changed how people were doing things. And I think, in a way, AngloJS have been somehow you could kind of see that that's a spreadsheet for, for web. I think you might explain that further. Yes, yeah, so let's see. Uh, in spreadsheets, you can write these kind of things, and you can calculate a bunch of numbers together. With AngloJS, you can actually kind of glue things on your HTML in a declarative manner. So in a way, uh, whenever some, somebody types something into input box or input uh, element, uh, it automatically updates the DOM right here. So in a way, you're kind of referring declaratively in, in, inside a web page. And this kind of changes how you are doing things. So in a way, this enabled business people to build 
business apps right in their, web, their uh, spreadsheets. If you just think about what happened before the spreadsheet, it was quite complicated to build those same apps. And I think with Angular, more and more designers and front-end developers, they can build quite well-working prototypes directly in a declarative manner. So that's kind of changing how people are uh, building apps. In a way, the, the second thing is that when those designers, they start to build prototypes, and they go to the boss guy with the prototype and see, say that, hey, I designed this, and you can actually click around, and it seems to be working. And then you have your team who have built this beautiful prototype, and it actually really, really works, unlike the designer's prototype. But it's, it looks like a designed by a developer kind of thing. And the boss guy sees these two prototypes. Guess what? He chose the designer prototype. And he just says to your team that, hey, you guys uh, could try, but just let's use this designer's AngularJS-based prototype as a basis, and you guys add some REST APIs and plumbing on the back end, and it's going to be fine. Yeah, and that's the case where, like, Jonas says, ah, that should be trivial to do. You can do it, and I run. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it's not just about that, of course. AngularJS is pretty good for the developer productivity as well, and, and it adds really powerful way of doing testing. So my question is, is could the web components be the next disruptive trend? I mean, could they, these guys change the market in a similar fashion as the client, client MV, whatever frameworks have been? So first of all, what are uh, web components? Is it like this? So you put a tag on the page and something pops up. I mean, this is pretty useful. It's really useful. <laughs> or is it like this, that you have a bunch, bunch of standards that do kind of add certain technical facilities for you? You can create new custom elements. You can write. Uh, HTML templates, you can import those components with HTML imports, and, and so forth. You can hide these components beho behind Shadow DOM. Is this the kind of reason why they are disrupting things? Yeah, like good luck like convincing your boss that, hey, yes, we should use Shadow DOM. That's yeah, not that's what your boss what thinks. Yeah, that's what I have wanted, Shadow DOM. So yes, it's, that's it's, what it, bosses want. These are not changing anything, I mean, from the market perspective. So instead, what you can actually do with this, it's kind of game changing. I mean, if you put all these four things together, you can start building components on web. And these components, they are actually robust in a way that if you build it, your dear colleague doesn't break it right away. Uh, they simplify things. Your super smart team builds uh, a uh, nice looking component, and then the guys over there in the, that other department, they can just reuse it, and, and, and even they can kind of build pretty nice application with that. And of course, you can, when you put it in a package, people all over the world, they can reuse it pretty easily. And this is completely different thing that has been on the web before. I mean, it, this far it has been a monolithic framework like, uh, I don't want to name any, any framework. <laughs> They're not name anyone. Uh, Yahoo UI, for example. These guys, they actually noticed that it's a bad idea to build a monolithic framework, and they can change how they are doing stuff, and they actually cancel the whole project for, for it. So basically, with the components, developer designers, they can build UIs much more easy. And this easy is, is a good thing, because it m means less cost, and they can build apps that they couldn't have built otherwise. But the thing is that there are pretty good component oriented frameworks already around. I mean, who's using one of these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to have everybody kind of wave their hands. Uh, these are awesome, especially the left one. But uh, they have been around for a while. They have been providing all these benefits for the components. And now there is standard coming up that is basically providing the same benefit. What happens? I mean, are we in trouble? At least I'm asking this question because our business relies on, on we being able to kind of add value for our users in form of components. So is it like something really bad happening? And let's say two examples out of this. So 
our value proposition is that basically both frameworks, they provide components, at least the componentization that you can reuse things. Both provide Java language. So you can write UIs in Java. That's cool, right? So yeah. it, And you can use all those like IDE tools that are really, really good and testing tools and all those. Yeah, no Java JavaScript spaghetti whatsoever. Nope. So that's a normal pitch that we are having. We, in case of Vardy, we're also going to give a pitch that you have automated communication. You don't have to write any RPC by yourself and you get push and whatnot. So basically, this is the value that we bring. This is our pitch. And what's happening right now is that kind of pretty critical part of the pitch, it's, it's kind of going away. So is it really that now when web components are coming, these kind of frameworks are in a trouble, or at least they are providing less for you? And I mean, if they are providing less, and there are new frameworks on the market as well that get the same benefit of web components, and they can provide other kind of values at the same time. I mean, Meteor pro provides uh, possibly to write JavaScript both on the client and the server side and automatically run those on the client and the server side and have a automatic data synchronization and cool stuff. So if they combine that benefit with the components that are brought by web components, can GWT compete? Can we compete? You forgot Singular. Yeah, that's, that's another one. Yeah, although that's kind of good already, but yeah. So in a way, I, I'm kind of seeing that web components, they will disrupt the market. And the basic question is, is this an opportunity or threat? Of course, first, it looks like a threat. I mean, I remember back in 2007, was it? When GUIT actually was announced. And we have been in the market on a, on a while. We, we started in 2000 and had a first open source release in 2003. And then Google comes up with a framework that allows you to program web apps in Java. Holy shit, we were scared. So the first kind of reaction was to panic, and the second one was to, oh my goodness, could we actually use this? I mean, we have been only providing extensions in JavaScript, and nobody could extend Bardin before GWT. I mean, we had a really nice client side, and the thing was that it was so complicated that only part of our guys could actually extend it. No, none of the users could extend it. And then we made a hard choice, threw that away, and rewrote everything in GUID for the client side. And after that, it was beautiful. Everybody could extend that. And now we have 500 add-ons in the directory extending that. So in a way, we could actually turn that into opportunity for us. Could we do something like this with the web components? So Leif, could you kind of show what we have been prototyping lately and, and building lately? OK. We have been building Vardin components, which is like the beginnings of a web component library. So just like components that you can use, not any like, because like letting Angular or React or whoever wants to take care of this, like connecting the components together. We only would then focus on, at least on the client side, only focus on providing the actual component implementations because it seems actually like, like most libraries don't want to provide that. They just focus on putting components together. So what we have done is create avoiding components. Uh, nope. Mm. So here on like Vardin Labs page, we have this uh, some, what is going on here? Let's resize the browser a bit. There we go. Uh, yes, so web components, we have made this like example of how you could use these web components. This is like a demo listing superheroes that are on charge right now eliminating all the bad guys in the world so we could like open one of those, see that, okay, this is this kind of guy. He's in that place right now and it's really useful if you need to eliminate bad guys. Press the button. You reached me at a bad moment. Okay, you I'm can't hear this. But we have like, shut up. <laughs> uh, we have like I integrated like web component for, for using like voice syn synthesis and Google Maps and those different kind of components. Uh, actually looking at what this looks like, 
in just the... Just to kind of note, uh, this is... We had a really hard time coming up with the demo application, and then we thought that most of the guys using Varian, they actually want to build CRUD type of views, so we just built a CRUD type of view. And what we're going to see what we could do with Polymer. So this is not the Varian application, this is a Polymer application. Yeah, this is completely client-side, only like HTML and JavaScript running in the browser. We, we actually even fake the communication in it. Uh, but basically, the way this is structured, if, if you look here in a DOM inspector, it's just like, okay, there's lots of stuff around this on the page, but this actual app is only like one hero app element that we have implemented. So and corresponds that, to body UI? Yep. In a way. Yeah, and inside that, we then have like some styles using a Polymer core style tag, which like helps with some styling things. And then inside it, we have like, Again, just a bunch of custom-made components. So we have like hero list, which is actually like this, this list of heroes, and then like hero details, which was the one that was opened, which is like only viewed when, when, when clicking on a hero, and then the hero edit, which is then inside that one also to do the editing. And then further drilling down inside hero list, we have inside the shadow root inside hero list, we again like have vGrid, which is like one of our web components that we have made that lists all the data. And that actually gets it, its data from this core Ajax, which is once again like part of the Polymer project. So can meet, m match these like mixing and matching and just put components from different vendors, put them together and things just work really smoothly. So who has built anything with Polymer or web components? So who has built something out of Gu with Guit or Varin? So this is basically the same stuff. I mean, if you look at the component tree, it's just a component tree. There are components, there are components inside components. So wiring is a bit different, the language is a bit different. But more or less, it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, next, I will also show you like Actually, already this morning, I showed you a little bit about the vGrid web component. I will dig slightly further into that one now. So here's again the same case with like a long list of, of GUID features that I have rated. Uh, once again, like just including one JavaScript to, to get everything to show up. Uh, have this long table, lots of data, good. Just, oh, we have this small penalty because Jonas has a an American keyboard, and I'm not really used to that, so that's why I code so slowly today. Actually, I was asking Leif just before the session that could he use VI for that, and he refused that US keyboard is enough. Yeah. Mm, that's there about like and this. If you know this, like we this. just include Vardin Components JS as a script locally. We also have Vardin CD and now available, so you can basically put these components to any web page. Yeah, but considering how spotty the network has been here, I didn't dare to use that here. So I have a local copy. So here we have once again the same that I showed you on uh, during the keynote session. This is not really exciting in itself because it like most of the times you don't want to put all your data into HTML, but instead you want to actually like load it from a server or something like that. So let's have a look at how this could be done. We are once again like completely in JavaScript land here. Uh, what we already have found here is that we have just using standard DOM API to find the grid, compo uh, grid element. And what I want to do is that I want to uh, set just a property of this. This is a... Uh, so you're putting a data source for it? Yes. Who was in live session uh, about uh, uh, grid and, and HTML table? So guess what? This is exactly the same component, actually. Yeah, we'll come to that slightly later as well. I really so, like this keyboard. So this data source, what it does, it's just a JavaScript function that gets called by grid every now and then. And the parameters we get here is the index, like where are we right now and how many rows should we fetch at this time. So let's also here start then by just creating like an array because we should return an array like one row per, when one item in the array per row that, that should be shown up in grid. 
so rows and so this. when they can read this, uh, when the user is sc scrolling the grid, it just ask from this method, what should I show on the grid? On the grid, and this is synchronous, so this is pretty simplified example. Yeah, we we we'll start making it simple just by not just generating the data, and then we will add add asynchronous to it slightly later. So what we want to do is that we will just loop over like starting at at i. That could be, for instance, starting at index, and then we loop loop, I said, uh, until we have like i is uh, less than index plus the count. And then we find the right keys again. And then we have, need to open the if. This is really exciting. Should we switch if I code? And no, no, no. <laughs> You're the boss. You shouldn't be coding. Yeah, I'm sad. <laughs> So what we want to do here is that we want to create like, we just want to append to these rows. This is what we do. I have a laser pointer <laughs> back at work. I'm going, hmm, there is a mistake right over there. Yeah, I don't <laughs> see it. Oh, yeah, equals. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so what we want to push is that just some really fun example here, like i and then i times I, so I squared, basically. And unless I have any more coding errors here, this will actually work out. Uh, yeah, one thing I forgot, at least need to tell grid also how much data it has. Grid uh, row count equals, let's put 1,000, 10,000? Mm. Let's go with 10,000. Like this, maybe now it shows up. Yeah, so now we have like generated this content just with a small JavaScript function. And if you have a keyboard, you know how to use this goes twice as fast. And if you went to live session, you actually know the gory details behind it. So it does hardware accelerated scrolling and DOM reuse and uh, supports all kinds of different devices for actually detects if it's iOS 8, it uses native uh, touch uh, scrolling in iOS 7. It actually measures how fast your finger goes when it kind of goes off the screen. and it has a lot of gory details behind it. Of course. So let's continue coding for a short while. So now we have like synchronously, we just like create the data and return it straight away. Uh, if we have a server, we actually want to fetch data and that takes a while and we don't want to keep the browser locked up during that time. So the other like way of using this is that we also use the callback function that you get as a parameter. And that instead of returning the data, we instead do a set a timeout, uh, a function here. I'm starting to get the hang of this one. No, like this. Yeah, I guess the next laptop you are buying is with the US keyboard. Mm. <coughs> Let's see about that. <laughs> so here we have just like, what we do is just that we set a small delay to emulate that we are going over the network. And then we just pass the rows into that one instead of returning them. And unless I have any compile errors again, we'll now see that. Compile errors, it's JavaScript. Yeah, it's still compiled by the browser, at least V8. Uh, so yeah, now we have once again the same data. But when I scroll, you see that, OK, it takes a while. And then the data appears. So, so in this way, this would be the same way that you would actually get data from a server. And it's really like just a couple of lines of JavaScript here. And there are actually many, many features. You can actually just point at the RESTful data source, and it just fetches data from there. And so this is just for the demo. Yeah. So that was the demo. It wasn't that hard. Come on. I helped with this. Yeah, that as well. <laughs> So what, what's actually inviting components? We are releasing like version 0.1 now. It's really early stage still. We, we are trying to figure out how, uh, all the details. So in this one, we have like grid is the like centerpiece of it, really the highlight. And then we have also includer, our slider component and progress bar components. Those are more like so you can try how things work together. So we kind of decided that we want to take the hardest component that we can think of start from that and then have a couple of extra components just to kind of see that we can 
uh, build that package with multiple components. So this is just the beginnings. Yeah, we plan, plan to add all the components later on. Uh, one reason for why you might want to use this is that uh, all Vardin's components are like themed with uh, our theme engine called Valo. This is like SaaS based and really cool, lets you really easily make like everything consistent with everything just by tweaking a couple of uh, parameters in your like SAS definition. So just, just as said, a couple of parameters and then you get like those different appearances for the same bu like button component. Uh, why would you want to use this? One case is that, okay, I get charged to, hey, could you make a login screen for me? Okay, I do something, throw it together. What do you think about this? Looks bad. I want to have a black one. You want to have a black one? Okay, let's tweak a couple of parameters. Mm. What about now? Even more ugly. Even more ugly? You said it should be black. We have a UX team as well, and Leif is not part of that, obviously. So, <laughs> so in, anyways, you're going to have a multiple tests and multiple tryouts, and maybe some of these might be looking good. Yeah, but still. None of these, I Yeah, none of these, but the one you would make is good. But the point is that this is actually pretty simple. I mean, I just say, please make another one, and he makes another one, and yeah. it doesn't take that much. But when you have like tons and tons and tons of components, as we have in, in a proper com uh, common framework, kind of building themes for all of these in a way that they are consistent and, and follow all the same rules, that's pretty, pretty big problem. Yeah. At least takes weeks or in some cases, months. Yeah, but the trick here is like all the, com all the styles for all the components follow the same like basic variables that you define in SAS. So actually like you can have like three different like variables and then, or three different sets of variables and then just like things like, do we have a gradient inside the button? Do we have rounded corners? Is it raised? What border color do we have? All those kinds of things are just like really easy to, to tweak, and when you tweak it once, all components behave consistently according to that, so like. It, it's not just like that, hey, we say that the color is this, we say that base color is this, and then the components calculate all kinds of different highlights and whatnot out of this color, or we say that the font size should be that, and all the proportions, and the default for the proportions, spacings, whatnot, are calculated from this, so you can. Yeah, to, to be of course you can override it if you don't want to have those defaults as well. And also, of course, this theme is, of course, like resolution independent, so it works just as well like on retina screens or mobile devices or anything, no bitmaps as well. So all those like graphics you see there, it's just like font icons, SVG, that kind of stuff. Uh, this is just like, you, you, you can look at like our demos to see lots of variants of how this works and responsiveness in it and just everything is, is really cool and awesome and all the adjectives. The other reason that you might want to use Vardin components today would be the grid component because you can use it like anywhere. You don't need to even know how to use a grid compiler, although you of course know that. But then you can actually use the grid version of, of grid. Yeah. And the reasons for that, one is like this lazy loading, it's really fast, scrolls really smoothly, hardware accelerated, anything you might want on that accord. Uh, it's mobile fr friendly. What component isn't mobile friendly today? Uh, supports, this is actually quite interesting because like from the Java code, getting support for like lots of rows of headers and footers and span, call spans inside those, it's really like messy from Java code, the API. We managed to get it quite good, I think, but compared to HTML, you just like put everything just as you would in an HTML table, and it's really interesting, like, difference between how those different ways of expressing things make things work in completely different ways. And the last feature that we want to highlight for vGrid is the renderer support. This is also, like, usable from from JavaScript so that you can just define like your template row that contains, for instance, other web components and then grid just like creates those on the fly while you scroll, put, putting the data in there. So you can basically render anything in those cells. You can put canvases over there and we have made it really, really fast. 
So that's basically what we are experimenting or playing with at the moment, uh, what in components packets. Uh, it's free, Apache license, and it's not stable. I, I wanted to say it's stable. It's 0 0.1. It's so this kind of uh, beckoning of, of, of what there could be. Uh, but I decided that maybe I could kind of expand a bit business reason why we are doing this. I mean, we have been do, building tools for building web apps since 15 years now. Uh, our kind of logic has been that, hey, we put Java on the front, and, and it kind of abstracts away from HTML. So we make it easy and, and by adding abstraction. And the whole reason for that has been that we wanted to give you maximal developer productivity and still have a really nice looking UIs. So this has been what we have been doing for a long time. And basically, it always leads to a bunch of components. This is the core value why people want to use such frameworks. I think this is, what, is, this is the most important of those uh, three values that we provide. And this kind of suits pretty well with the components, uh, with web components. Maybe we could just provide the components. There is a large open source uh, ecosystem around Vardin nowadays. And how we make money, how we actually uh, feed ourselves is that we sell add-on tooling, we sell services for people who are using our free fr framework. So yeah. basically that's the model how we work. And it's important to understand that we kind of live and breathe this Vardin framework thing. I mean, 100% of, of our revenues are coming out of this Vardin framework, and we have been doing this for 15 years, and seeing that there are web components coming, and they kind of pose a threat for Vardin framework, it kind of puts your thinking what you should be doing about it. So what we are doing is basically we open the labs. We want to kind of give these experiments to you so we could get feedback from you whether we are doing anything interesting right now. And the basic idea is that when we have these three value propositions in Vardin framework, maybe we could kind of split this thing into two parts. So we could have this statically typed Java and automated communications in Vardin framework, but split the components parts totally separate out of this. So we have two different products, and they can be used, indep used independently. Although framework, of course, depends on these components. You might not want to use it without any components. Uh, how this works technically is that we have a bunch of web components in the package. All of these have uh, web component APIs, JavaScript APIs. But we also added APIs for all the major frameworks. We have an AngularJS API over there, so you can bind these today with AngularJS. We have a GUID API, both Elemental API as well as Widget API, so you can use these as widgets or through the Elemental APIs. And of course, we have service and Java APIs. So one component, multiple APIs. And how you actually use these is when you are building, let's say, simple form like this. Uh, traditionally, you just code. You kind of create a layout, put all these components inside that layout, and after a bit of fiddling, you have this on your screen. We also introduced a declarative format a uh, couple of months back. Actually, it's still in beta. Yep. And in the declarative format, you can basically write this in HTML, except that you are using Vardin components, v dash text field and v dash native select and so forth to actually put this on the screen. It looks suspiciously like web components, even though this is today rendered as traditional server-side Vardin framework. So we actually read this HTML on the server side, spit out Vardin component tree, and it looks like this. So what's the good side from this declarative design? You can write HTML. Is that the good thing? Maybe for some. For some, it's that they work really well with designers. So we built Vardin Designer tool. This is Eclipse-based designer. We are working on IntelliJ-based version as well. And you can basically just drag and drop these components on the screen and build your <coughs> UIs really easily. You can go back and forth between the HTML. You can edit these over there as well. You can even have your mobile device on your hand while you are editing this and see exactly the same UI updated over there while you are designing it. Or give that to your friend and say that, hey, please test it. And he says, please add a button on the left. And you just add a button on the left, and it pops right away on his device. So it's actually pretty useful for designing stuff. So in a way, 
when we add this designer over here for building these designs, and we have modern framework for rendering these designs, we have a pretty nice combination already. Except that we thought that we could use these modern components, uh, web components here on the right side to render these, actually. So we could have these three products working together in a nice harmony. And that kind of, when you kind of draw this picture, it kind of put us thinking that maybe we could actually do even more. So how about if we start adding frameworks over here? If we kind of put this warning framework in the, on, a, on a kind of same level with the other frameworks. So you could take this warning framework away and use GUIT over there, or Angular, or Meteor, or whatnot, and still have warning designer working and the warning components working in this chain. It actually might be a pretty nice business opportunity for us for expanding the, the user base. So this is just a, something that we are working on right now and, and uh, kind of thought where we are most probably going. But the question is when. I know it's, it's really important question for us when we can go over there, but also really important question for you, when you can use these web components. I mean, Leif said that you can download a 0.1 component package right now and start using it. And if you do that back in home and, and tell your team that, hey, we are going to be using this body grid component, what they do ask, what's the first trouble in their mind? When can we use it for production Yeah. And why is that? Are you questioning Leif's code? It's perfect, I promise you. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm, it's pretty stable. It's, it's really stable. You, 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 you wouldn't even believe me when I told you. Exactly. Oh, no. <laughs> not that one. I mean, we have these standards, and we don't know whether they work. And when I go to canIuse.com, I get pictures like this. HTML templates. Quite a lot of green, actually, except if we ignore IEs. Nobody likes IEs anyway, so... Uh, and then the next standard, custom elements. OK, now we are, don't have Firefox anymore or Safari. It starts to be a bit of a problem, I mean. If, if you are fine with just Chrome, go ahead. Shadow DOM, same story, imports, and so forth. So in the end of the day, today, you can only use web components in Blink. And that's it. So if that's good enough for you, use Slave's grid component. Of course. There is a possibility of using polyfills. Um, you might have heard that Polymer project that have built really nice polyfill for many, uh, many browsers. They basically moved this polyfill out to webcomponent.org, so it's uh, downloadable separately as a webcomponent.js, and it simulates these things inside current web browsers, any evergreen browser. So actually everything since IE 10, at least in theory. This is 0 0.5, so. Yeah, 0 0.8 coming any day now. So in a way, this is from Polymer Spades, and this is what they claim today. Uh, I wouldn't be as kind of optimistic as these guys with the, these colors. They could be a, maybe a bit grayish, not that greenish, but there are some, some all are, all, features. Yeah, all in all things like kind of does work, yes, but there's always that one gotcha. And I think you can summarize it in such a way that if you are using ever, evergreen browsers and you are okay with the polyfills, they have a performance implication, they have a, um, limitations. You can use web components today, you can use grid components today from these packets. But if you really need like native uh, web component implementation, it means things like CSS sandboxing really are working, then you might want to wait for a bit. At least you can start experimenting, but maybe not putting this into production yet. So the question is, when is this soonish? When you can actually have this in the, all the major browsers? Anyone knows? If you do, please tell us. Yeah, we will be we're really, really interested in hearing. Um, we can guess, but these are just guesses. So Firefox, I think these guys have been doing pretty nice work, and they are interested in, in these standards. So I would guess that they will be 
having a fully working implementation by the end of the year. I would be willing to bet on that. More important would probably be what happens with the iOS 9. So that this is, we will be here in June or so, where the iOS 9 will be having a Safari that would implement this. If yes, then I think by the end of the year we have a more or less everything on the native side. If not, we have to live with polyfills. Fortunately, polyfills are pretty good on, on I, iOS 8 already. And the old browsers, they never are going to be working, so just forget about it. So IE9, then don't do, there is nothing that you can do about it. So, yeah, the thing really is that most of like looking at the talks here, for instance, and otherwise also, it seems that like GWT is mostly focused on using existing web components. But what if you could also create web components using GWT? There's like, it could also make sense. So let's actually have a look at like how we approach this, this no. thought. Just to kind of repeat, so you can really nicely use web components today if you're using JS Interop. So it's a really nice bridge to web components. Yeah, but we want, wanted to go one step further. So really the, the thought was that, okay, we don't want to implement a grid in JavaScript because it's really like, it's lots of code and getting it to like keep, keep it structured and, and everything, it would be a real mess. So. Guess what? This was not my estimate this 17 months. No. It, it, it was a bit different. <laughs> yeah, it was like, yes, uh, beginning of the year, not just stating which year. So what we have actually done, uh, this is getting like uh, low level details here. Uh, we have made this our own like hack for registering uh, custom elements from GWT. And what we actually register here, this is like what would be run in the entry point of, of the thing that actually provides the web components. What we have done is that we have like this VCV grid, like web component voting grid, that is like an HTML. It's JS exported and JS typed and whatever. Uh, it implements this lifecycle attached, which is also something that we invented that maps directly to like attach event for custom elements. Inside this class, we have this grid widget instance. This is exactly the same grid that is involved in 7.4, the exact same grid that I, for instance, jumbled about for almost an hour yesterday. And what actually happens is that when we get this like attach callback, when, when this element is added to the browser, then we create a shadow DOM root we add some styles to it, add a wrapper div that we might actually get rid of at some point. Then we use some really nasty magic to take this wrapper div, this container, and make it behave like a GWT panel, even though it isn't like original one. And then what we can do is that we can just like to that panel that is attached inside the shadow dome, we can just add this grid widget, and grid widgets is just happy because, hey, I'm inside a panel, panel widget, doesn't care, care about anything else. And in that way, basically everything just works. The last thing that is needed is also to like take, map like when you as assign an HTML attribute or set a property, then that should also be mapped back so that we have a JS property definition here that gets called and we do whatever is needed to make the actual grid widget also know what has happened. So I guess the exit summary is that if you have a GUID widget, you just put a hacky wrapper around it and then it's, pff, it's a web component. Yeah. So actually, who thinks that it might make sense to, to wrap around some of your components? Only one guy. No, some shy guys as well. Because we have had a long debate in the team whether this makes sense. I mean, should we write these components in JavaScript, in Polymer, and whatnot? Or should we write this in GUID? And actually, it's a pretty strong argument for actually using GUID for, to write these components when the components are complex, like grid. If the component is really simple, like, I don't know if you have simple components, but really small component, it actually makes sense to write that in JavaScript. And you can do both, and they can live side by side. So it, 
just choose the best tools for each component. Yeah. So going back to this, like how things fit together, let's add different ways of actually implementing this like V component. So it could be, as said, made in JavaScript, Polymer, or just X tags or raw web components or whatever. We could take a, like, implement it natively as though it would be a like web component using GWT, like using JS interrupt directly. Or then we could use a like GWT widget that we wrap as a GWT element and that way exposing that as a web component. And the other cool thing here is that once we have this like web component, it has a defined API, we can actually automatically generate all these other APIs. So that's like almost zero overhead. It might be for some complex cases, you might want to do some parts by hand, but most, most things can be like auto-generated, so you actually only need to care about one API. If you want to like have a more close look at how this is done, go to github.com slash vadin slash components. It's all there, it's all open source. If you want to have a look at or actually use these things, then uh, designer is in Vardin labs, so vardin.com slash labs. It's preview right now and will be out at some point, a couple of months, I think. Something like that. Yep. We also released a new product called uh, or product experiment at this phase, but product called Vardin Elements. So this is add-on for existing Vardin users so that you can use any web component directly out of the server side. So just take, let's say, uh, paper library and use all of these paper components in your Vardin apps today with this wrapper. This is also in Vardin Labs. For the components themselves, uh, these demos and many of the examples how to use this, both from JavaScript, from AngloJS, from plain uh, HTML, from GUID, they are in Wadi Labs as, as well. Uh, there are a couple of distribution packages. The zip file contains everything. We have Bower distribution, so if you are using Bower, you can just add this, these components to your project from there. They are available in CDN. And if you just want to use grid widget from GUID application, better option actually would be to use it from Vadim 7.4 because that's stable and, and supported. And actually it even works with the old browsers as well. So we support everything since IE8 over there. But I guess this was more or less everything. Do we have time for questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>